J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello. Welcome to Talking Books on Web Talk Radio. I'm J.T. Crowley, the host. And today I warmly welcome from Melbourne in Australia, David Lassen, to talk about his book, The Man for the Job, My 39 Years Service in the Royal Australian Navy. Or should I say, Lieutenant? Hmm. Let's see what he wants to be called. David, come and join me. Thank you very much. Now, David, before we open this book, would you care to tell the audience a little about yourself and why you wrote this book? Sure. Um, obviously, I'm in Australia, and back in the uh, late 70s, I was at high school, and a bunch of my friends decided that uh, they were going to go down to to the Navy recruiting and they con- conned me into going with them. And basically uh, we went down there and did all the tests and so forth. And I was the only one that passed the test. So I was the only one that actually got into the Navy at that time. Um, why I wrote the book, I think at, when I first joined, I never knew how long I was going to serve. I thought I was, might, might make the first four years and that'd be about it. However, as things went on and I just grew to love it, um, I uh, went to different areas in my medical, because I was in the medical branch, and I did different uh, different jobs in different places and really uh, loved it. But sometimes we had to, we saw some pretty horrible stuff. As you can probably imagine, the medics tend to get some of the worst stuff um, over time. And I was, when I would come back to Australia and talk to my friends and mainly my civilian friends, in the dog showing world, because I took that up as a sport, um, I they I would talk to them about what I'd done, and they said, "Oh, you should write a book." And I went, "Yes, okay," and then forgot about it um, until I got out after the, after thirty nine years service. I thought, if I don't write it down, there's some pretty historical stuff I was part of, and it helped me as well because I ended up I had uh, PTSD after a, after a lot of trauma and so forth. And it did actually help me to get through that as well. So the reason I wrote the book was to, it was cathartic. I was able to get the story out and a lot of my friends have have read it and reckon it's okay as well. When you look at the book, everybody, it's, for me, there aren't any chapters. It's a collection of um, David's life, you know, across 60 to 70 events. It's, there are the stories of what he saw, what he experienced in the Royal Australian Navy. Some of the uh, the events are humorous. Some have a serious side to them. Some have a combination of a bit of humor and a serious side to them. But the book really is a collection of events of David's life in the Royal Australian Navy. Now, if you think we're going to sit here and go through all 60, 70 events, forget it, we're not. Because it would take the 39 years to tell the story. And we haven't got 39 years. We have 40 minutes. (laughs) So David and I have agreed beforehand as to where to focus on the book. But if you want to know a little bit more about himself and his book, then you can go to his website, www.davidlassam.com or his publisher's website, Exebrus, www.exebrus.com.au. David, you have led a very fascinating life within the Royal Australian Navy, particularly in the Medic Corps. So I want to go to the first area, the first event that we agreed upon, and that's HMAS Albatross, 1970 to 80. And if you want to know what HMAS stands for, everybody, I'll tell you. It's either His or Her Majesty's Australian Service. I'm intrigued, David, to see what was life, you know, like for you on these bases. Um, no, you you talk about the crash team. You talk about. Uh, the emergency call-outs you got to Mariah, the hospital windows, the laundry situation? It was, um, 
that's a little bit different to what everybody might um, perhaps expect. Uh, it's a barracks type environment on most of the bases, especially back then in the late 70s and early 80s. It's a little bit better now, but, um, you know, four, four blokes to a cabin, um, and that's how you lived, basically. And if you weren't married, you lived on the base. Um, Albatross is near Nowra in New South Wales, and it's at where we train all our pilots. Um, back then, it was for the fixed-wing jets, um, the tracker aircraft, which are anti submarine aircraft, and helicopters. And, of course, being... Um, a medic and being, we had a hospital there for in case anything did go wrong. And there were a few times that things uh, did go wrong. And how we started off uh, when I first arrived is there was, a, if the crash alarm went, so that was to indicate that a um, there had been a crash we, and you didn't, you weren't there to see it, but you knew the alarm had gone off. Um, everybody would uh, rush to the front door to get out into the ambulance, which was a rather large four-wheel drive beast. A few injuries from just on the medic side ended up that they changed the rules a bit and we had special teams and I was lucky enough to be on the teams. So if the alarm went off, we would race down to the aer aerodrome uh, and wait for further orders to see what had happened. Um, the two Twice while I was actually there, we had one of the fixed-wing um, aircraft crashed uh, during a re re rehearsal for a... Um, a, an air day, so they were practicing to do some stuff, and one of the aeroplanes crashed. And we had uh, I had two helicopters um, ran into each other, and luckily didn't crash, but they hit each other. It was amazing how they that they got through that. Um, one of the earliest things I remember about the helicopters was uh, I was part of the medical um, overnight team, and we got a call from a place about 150 kilometres away down on the New South Wales coast. And a young fellow had been driving his car and it, was, it had been raining and he lost control and he ran into a uh, electrical pole, um, which were rather large. And uh, he, he didn't um, do very well out of that. So we were asked to fly him from the, the town he, where he was to Canberra, where, which was the nearest hospital. So uh, we flew at about one in the morning, as it always is, uh, in the rain, storms, billowing around myself and the doctor uh, with all our, our gear. And we got to the little hospital, um, it's what we call a bush hospital, so it's a quite a small one, but um, we landed the helicopter in and unfortunately, because there was such a storm going, um, our rotor wash, which is the wind from the rotors, blew open all the windows in the wards and the curtains came flying out. There were patients sticking their heads out the windows and all sorts of things, so it was a bit... Uh, it was a bit of a bit of bit of excitement. Unfortunately, the uh, young man passed away um, just after we got there, and uh, we went back with that. We flew, obviously, flew back with that. Um, but and that was my first ever uh, had a, dealing with uh, death in the in the RAN, and I've had to do that a few times since then. Of course, because everybody that. Although um, David uh, was, you know, employed by the um, the Royal Australian Navy, they very often were called out to uh, support the local hospitals, particularly around crashes and incidents. If they had the equipment, they were called up, and that was part of the agreement. They had to go and assist the civilian side of things. I'm right, aren't I? Yes, yes. Uh, it, usually if it was a pretty big F in thing, they would invite us to, well, ask for our help. And that happens all over Australia, actually. Uh, so if there's, a, if there's a large incident, often with flooding or fires or um, that sort of thing, they'll always come to the Defence Force, and that'll be the Army, Navy and or Air Force that will go out there to help. So um, on this occasion, it was fairly small, but we had the equipment to get to this um young person but unfortunately as I said uh, in this particular instance he didn't make it um, but we we do this sort of stuff all the time actually Let's take the audience uh, David to um, another little event um, the stories in deploying to the Indian Ocean they mm -hmm. seem very interesting you know but the wharfies uh, they were on strike. Now, these are the people, everybody, 
who support the ships back in those days on the dockside. And they were very, very important. And if you didn't have them, well, your, your ship, your aircraft carrier had a bit of a problem getting in and out of, in and out of the harbour because they needed the tugboats then. Not like these days, these enormous cruise ships and these enormous warships, they can self-propel themselves in and out and turn around in sixpence. But back in those days, there was no such thing. So the wharfies, because that's what you call them in Australia, they were on strike. And so the Melbourne aircraft carrier had to get itself out of Sydney Harbour, no tugboats. And the captain, I believe, had to recall and use a particularly interesting method to get his boat, his ship, out. And we've got the young sailor whose attempt to copy the local Indonesian kids on a water slide. Well, that didn't go according to plan, did it, David? So what are you telling me? Uh, well, I'll, I'll deal with the first metaphor. Um, HMAS Melbourne was Australia's... Uh, at that time, was the only aircraft carrier we had. And uh, we were leaving on deployment, in particular this one that we actually did go to Indonesia on. And at that time, I can't remember the exact reason the Wharfies were on strike, but it was on something to do, uh, I believe, now even though it was 1980, I think it was something to do with Vietnam. I don't know why I think that. But anyway, they decided they weren't going to help us get out of the harbour. So the captain had to re, uh, go back to stuff that they used to do in World War II to move ships around because a lot of the ships back then didn't have the ability to move, uh, as you suggested, like the big liners do nowadays with the propellers that move them at the front end and the back end sideways. So what the captain did, uh, as we were all standing on, on the, uh, the flight deck, as we do in our lovely uniforms, he decided to let go all lines, which is except for the aft line, so that the ship could pivot off the the with the back end still attached to the wharf so the front could come out. So what he did is he dropped what we call the pick or the anchor. Now, the anchor on an aircraft carrier, as you might imagine, is very large, and he dropped the anchor in harbour. It went straight to the, the bottom as it does, and as he, he gently ordered them to start to reef, reef it in, and because it had gone off slightly at an angle. By reeling it in, the whole bow moved out. So we went, went towards the port side or the left-hand side and he picked, it, picked the pick up and dropped it again. And he just kept moving the front until he had a straight run out from our wharf position straight out into the harbour where we could then turn right or to starboard and away we go. Um, so that was how we did that. And I was most impressed as a young sailor to be standing right on the bow, looking down, thinking, oh, this is pretty amazing to watch this sort of thing occur because I'd never even heard of it. But anyway, the, uh, the other part you mentioned was the Indonesian kids. Our first, my first ever foreign port of call was Jakarta. And uh, that was our, where we stopped for the first time. We had a couple of days there. And what happens when we go to these places? We get leave, if you're entitled, and you can go ashore and have a look at things and get in the sights and so forth. And the this particular day, young fella decided to go to the local swimming pool. And the local pool had the biggest slide you've ever seen in your life. And it had about three sections to it. So it went down, had a little bit of a bump, and then down, a bit of a bump, and then down into the pool. And the pool at the end was only about two feet deep. So you could come flying down that, hit the water, and stop before you hit the other side. Um, as sailors do, we tend to be a bit silly sometimes, and the young guys got up the top and were watching the, the uh, young Indonesian kids who'd been there and done these sort of things um, all the time. And they were standing up and sliding down it like they were surfing. And this one particular sailor decided he was going to try that, and he hit the first bump and fell over. And as he fell, he dislocated his neck um, at a very uh, important part of the neck, obviously. You don't want to dislocate anything there. And he's basically slid down the rest of the slide and landed in the water. Um, luckily for him, the uh, one of the other sailors, one of the senior sailors, had been at the same place. And he saw what had happened and he immediately 
jumped into the pool, as I said, which is only two feet deep, and went straight to him and would not allow anybody near him other than himself. And he just managed and he held his head um, and he had another couple of sailors come and hold his body so that he would not move his head. Um, and he then called for an ambulance to come and they brought him back to the ship. Now, back then, the hospitals perhaps in Indonesia weren't as nice as we'd hoped and so they decided to bring him back to the ship. So there we were looking after a young bloke who was literally um, paralysed from the neck down. So that it was, at that time, we had no idea how, how, how cook he was. Um, but interestingly, how we then moved on from that to actually to be able to still do our job, which was to fly aircraft at sea, was quite um, an amazing act. And what we did, we had him in the sick bay, especially um, on a special bed, and we sandbagged him. So we had little sandbags and we placed them all around his head and neck so that he could basically, he couldn't move. And what we did to maintain our ability to fly, um, because the if you've seen the war movies or the other, and more, more of the common ones, we have steam-driven catapults under the deck, but they sit right above the sick bay. So these things put out a massive amount of energy and when they fire, the whole place shakes. So to make sure that we didn't, he didn't get hurt um, when we were firing the aircraft on, we did practice launches with the machinery. And I was literally on the telephone, standing by, looking into the ward, and the doctors were all around him. And they would say, right, we're firing now. And they'd fire the catapult at a certain um, amount of, of uh, steam pressure. And the whole place had wrapped, and then they'd ask him, did that hurt? Are you okay? And we actually got it up to the point where we could launch aircraft and not affect the patient. So we took him then, rather than go to uh, Indonesia, as I said, Indonesia, we went to Singapore. And uh, we managed to keep flying and doing what we were supposed to be doing back in those days, which was during the Cold War, of course, um, do our flying stations and following submarines and other things. And this young bloke was taken off in Singapore, eventually flown back to Australia. And the last thing I heard was that he actually was walking again. He amazingly didn't rip any of his nervous cord. He just was bruised badly. And he was extremely lucky because if the Navy personnel who looked after him in the pool hadn't done what they had done, I would be guessing that he might not have made it. So that was... Uh, very interesting from our point of view as well, because I'd never had to, we, we had to do all sorts of things for this poor young bloke. But um, I, he was obviously discharged from the Navy because we couldn't hold him for, after a certain while. Um, but he was looked after. And they, um, as I said, he uh, he came good. And the last I heard, he was able to walk. So I haven't heard since, it was many years ago now, obviously, but um, I, I haven't heard anything else about him. But yeah, that's how that went. And I bet he avoided water slides. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, it was um, one of those yeah. things that sailors do and you just, oh, you shake your head and go, no, but they did anyway. I, I did notice, Dave, how you very carefully tiptoed around the issue, you know, when the sailors are in port, you generally tiptoed around, oh, Sometimes they yeah. do visit a few salubrious places and we'll move on. Yes. I'm not Moving on. Let's go to the next uh, um, area that I want to go to, cockies. Now, this is the abbreviation for cockroaches, everybody, and we had to go here. Now, Dave, what's the story around the cockroaches on the Melbourne aircraft carrier? Hmm... Um, and yes, support side workers refusing to assist with the docking of the HMAS uh, Melbourne. Go on, tell us. Okay, okay cockroaches. Unfortunately, um, in older warships, um, perhaps not so much in the new ones, but they still have a few problems. Unfortunately, cockroaches um, get on the ship, and once they're basically in, it's a bit hard to get rid of them. Um, we uh, used to have a lot of them, quite small ones, called, funny enough, called American cockroaches, and they were uh, all through the ship. But you wouldn't see them during um, 
when there was uh, when you had the lights on, of course, it was only when the lights went out that uh, you would you would hear them. And we used to have a bit of a game on the Melbourne where in the sick bay had happened as well. We turned the lights out and you'd wait a couple of minutes until there was this is uh, when we had no patience in, of course. Um, and you'd wait until you could hear the little things running around and then turn the lights on something and see how many you could stomp on before they um, got away. And the uh, this was a bit of a game that we had, but um, they were a bit of a pest. And there were um, some blokes, and I remember waking up one morning, I had a few bites on me, and it had been during the night. Um, the cockies would come out and just go over it, and you could get, they would have a bit of a bite on you as well. So it wasn't very pleasant at times. Um, as for the other one, again, on the Melbourne, this is, as I said, it's my favourite ship. Well, it is my favourite ship. I enjoyed being on her. And as we came back from the same trip, um, we were coming down the west coast of Australia across Bass Strait, which was absolutely like a pond. It was beautiful, not like the one we'd gone over, which was very rough. And we were coming into Melbourne, and the uh, the wharfies, again, were on strike. And it had something to do with the Navy per se, and I don't know why. Um, I can't, well, I was only a young bloke then, I had no idea. But... Instead of standing, everybody standing on the upper decks when you come into harbour and, and it looks really um, cool, and you might have seen it on the news there, sailors lined the, around the outside of the decks um, in their uniform, looks really flash. Well, as we were coming back in, the captain knew that we weren't going to get um, assistance to get alongside. So he did another trick that they used to do during World War II, and we had on board about eight, I think, anti-submarine tracker aircraft, which are the propeller-driven aircraft, the ones that fold their wings up. And we had, uh, so what he would do is he put three up in front of the island, which was the big tall bit that sticks out of the top of the ship, and lashed them down so they were facing outwards. And he put three behind the island, the same thing. And what he did as he came into the port, he was very slowly coming in, but to have control over the ship, he had the aircraft running and they would go to full blast and he would say, right, the forward three flat out and they would pull the aircraft front in, he would stop them and we would see saw in. So he'd do the back three and then the front three and she basically sidled into the wharf. And I'll never forget because all the wharfies were standing there just not doing anything and we had a bunch of sailors from a nearby base to come over and take the lines and there were a bunch of a crowd of people had come to see the ship burn, and they all broke into applause when the ropes went over. Um, and after watching this amazing event, I was because luckily enough, I was the flight deck medic that that particular day, and I got about there. And um, watching this was just really amazing, and I just was in awe of the captain. He just knew exactly what he was doing. And the cockroaches didn't help everybody. <laughs> no, they didn't. They, they, they didn't they, help. No, they disappeared very quickly. Yeah, they thought, hmm, time to disappear, <laughs> time to go. Anyway, <laughs> let's go to another story of days. HMAS Hewan, 1984 to 86. You enjoyed your time uh, there being a Taswegian, because this is where we're going to, Tasmania, everybody. And the story of HMS Ardent. Ah. Yes. Protecting Australia's oil rigs. And as I'm reading this out, everybody, this question, Dave is just lapping at me from the other side of the <laughs> computer in Australia. So, HMS Huon and pre booking lunch dates, the chocolate factory. It's not the USS Missouri. You got up to a few things here, didn't you? Uh, yes. Um, I was actually lucky enough to be posted to HMS Ewan twice, 84 to 86, and a bit later on in the 90s um, when I was in recruiting. Um, the main, these stories came from uh, my, my first time uh, at Hewan between 84 and 86, and Hewan's a very small naval establishment. There were 20 of us total, and it was basically there to support the Naval Reserve. Um, that's how we uh, back ourselves up in times when we need extra personnel, we have a reserve. 
and to, to keep um, the reserves, to keep people, because you don't want them just standing around and not and not being happy with the system, the reserves ran and maintained a patrol boat that we had. It was an old patrol boat, but it was very well kept. And she used to go to sea um, to look after the Bass Strait oil rig. So she'd sail from Hobart all the way around to the north of Tassie into Bass Strait and do what we call the Bass Strait oil rig surveys. And they were just there to show a presence and protect our um, oil reserves as uh, as they were then. Um, however, in the ensuing time, the, the reason that the uh, permanent people there was to maintain the engines and uh, do that sort of thing. And basically when the engines were would go through a half-life um, refit sort of thing, they'd come in and they'd do it all up and make sure to go. The, the boat had to then be taken out into Storm Bay and do trials. So you think, yeah, that's good. Um, but because we didn't have all that many sailors at the time, even though I was the medic, I was allowed to go onto the forecastle and I was in charge of the gun at the front. Not that we did anything with it, um, but I was the Kelly of the folks, which was very good for me. And what we would do is we'd go out into, into Storm Bay and run up and down at all rates and knots, do turns and so forth, just to see that the boat was fit to go to sea. The captain was one of the young lieutenants on board on board Huron, and he uh, was a really good bloke. And I remember when it was uh, came up to lunchtime, we were halfway down Storm Bay and we'd already um, booked this in advance, but we booked a luncheon with the local pub at a place called Kettering. And we pulled the boat into the little wharf there. The uh, pub sent down the, the school bus to pick us up. We left a couple of guys on board. Obviously, we couldn't just leave the boat with no one on board. And they took us up to the pub for a counter lunch. Um, no alcohol was... Um, no alcohol was uh, taken at all. We just had a lunch and it was the best seafood basket you've ever seen in life. Um, after that, we got back on board, sailed back down to the base, tied her up alongside the base and went home. So it was, uh, it was we don't do that very often, but we were lucky enough that we were able to do it on that case. But uh, the other ones you mentioned were the chocolate factory and a few things where we had a few... Um, things where the Americans would come to visit us. And the first occasion was the chief, the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet flew his uh, personal 707 into Hobart and was there for the, the Coral Sea, Battle of the Coral Sea um, commemoration. Um, and they we're about as far away from the Coral Sea as you can get in Tasmania, but we still had, um, we still conduct commemorations. And the Americans, as I said, flew this guy from Hawaii. Um, and I was given the task of looking after the flight crew on this plane. So I took them to basically, took them to Cadbury's, the chocolate factory down there in Hobart, and we, where they delighted in that. And I think I took them also up to the top of the mountain. So we've got a very large mountain in Hobart, Mount Wellington, and uh, they went and did that. So that was where that story came from. It was, um, again, one of those one-off things, and I don't think I've ever heard of them coming back, um, but I got to be part of that as well, so that, that was quite cool. The Missouri one was absolutely brilliant from my, from my perspective. Um, I, uh, 986, it was the 75th anniversary of the Royal Australian Navy, and they were having um, ships visit all the ports in Australia, all sorts of ships from all over the world, celebrating the fact that we were 75 years old. Um, and USS Missouri had just been recommissioned and she was on a world tour. So she had been in World War II. She was the ship on which the Japanese signed their surrender in Tokyo Bay and she'd been refitted and she was coming down and she came into Hobart. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life when I went down there and it was just before I moved on from Huon. So I only had about three days um but I went on board, as, as the medics do, and introduced yourself and gave them uh, the information for where the local hospital is, uh, et cetera, et cetera, ambulance, what number do you ring, and all that sort of good stuff to their medical people and ended up literally working for them for three days and been working very closely with them. And I was 
made an honorary medic of the Missouri and uh, before I left it, and it was really, really good. And as a bit of a sort of postscript to that, many years later, I went to Hawaii for a visit, and there she was again. She's now a museum ship um, in Pearl Harbor, and I, it was just great to be on it and just chatting with the people who um, – with the tour guides and that, they couldn't believe that I'd actually been on it in Australia back then. But it was a great, oh, it was an awesome feeling to just be a part of that and go on this absolute battleship. And where the Japanese signed the surrender was a brass plate in the deck, in the wooden deck, because it was wooden, it was amazing. But it was covered with a, with a perspex cover. Mm. So it was all, um, it was it was just amazing to be part of that. Let's take the audience, Dave, to the first Bali bombing, headquarters, oh. Northern Command, and other adventures. You talk about your posting to Darwin, NATO codes, the Royal Flying Doctor Service, retrieving patients from sea. What role did you play in the Bali bombing situation? Um, was everybody... Um... Hopefully, well, remember, um, this was a year after the uh, 9-11 attack on New York. So we, within a year of that occurring, or just after a year, um, a bombing occurred in Bali. Now, Bali is not far from Australia, and it's a very, it's a huge um, uh, tourist area, especially for Australians who go over there and let their hair down and do all the usual stuff. Um my role when I was in Darwin, I was what's called, and we go to the NATO codes here, is the J073. Now, that will mean absolutely nothing to most people. Um, but the J means joint, the 07 means health, and the 3 means operations. So I worked with the J075, who was joint. He was actually army, but he was in health, and he was the planner. So five was plans. So he would write all the plans for what we do in an emergency, usually for um, defence personnel. So if we're going to, and so we had all these plans, and we had logistics, and we had all this sort of stuff. And the headquarters is where all this was run from. On the day the Bali bombing happened, well, it happened at night, and I didn't usually find out until the next day. And I'd actually taken um, or been allowed to have a day, half a day off. Um, because my job was basically what we call watch on, stop on. When you're there, you're just there all the time. If you have to go, you go. And in this particular day, I'd heard, I'd gone into work on the Saturday and uh, my boss was there, which is a bit strange. And I said, oh, what's going on? And he told me that there'd been a bombing in Bali. And this meant absolutely nothing to me at the time. I had no idea how big this was going to get. And I decided, oh, well, and he said, I'll go to your your luncheon and things. So we went out to a barbecue out at the local wildlife place in Darwin. About an hour and a half later, I suppose I got an attack of the guilt and thought, well, I better go and check what's going on. So I left that and I went back to it. And, of course, by that time, things had ramped right up. And we had to organise the retrieval of the patients, um, of which there were many and the injured, um, from Bali and fly them back to Australia and move them from then from Australia, from Darwin, out to the other um, cities in Australia. And basically, as the operations guy, I was put in charge of looking after the C-130 aircraft that were flying in, the teams of doctors and um, air crew who were specifically trained for this, um, all, RAF, all RAF personnel, but they were each air, assigned, assigned to an aircraft, and... They all came in and they all flew out and we had stores to get. We had blood to get. I went and got all the blood from Lord Darwin Hospital, got it onto the planes as they were literally taxiing out and throwing stuff in the back of the aircraft. Um, we had stretches. We had all this sort of stuff that well, yeah, we probably weren't really prepared for, not expecting that sort of thing to happen. Um, I can tell you now, though, it's a totally different story because we learned a lot of lessons from this. But this was... Uh, Quite amazing because I don't think I slept for five days. Now, I know that sounds silly, but I, I doubt if I got more than a couple of hours a night and I was back up and making sure that I'd done everything. Uh, 
couple of interesting things. I remember seeing a photograph um, that came back after it all finished and it was a carload of our guys in Bali. One bloke was on the phone and it was all of them crowded into this little car. And he said to me, this is when you rang me. So I was actually speaking to him on the ground in Bali and they took a photo of the time he was doing it because we needed as much information as possible. As you can imagine, these two huge explosions have gone off, 200 people killed, 88 Australians killed. We had numerous injuries. Um, and, of course, their uh, hospital stuff, hospital system was totally overwhelmed and they, they, had, they just couldn't cope with it. So this is why we put all the people in. So I was literally running the uh, myself and I, I'm not... Um, there were obviously other people there, but I was basically put in charge of the uh, area at the airport that we had, and like I made sure all the ambulances were there. And uh, we had oh, they came from everywhere in the Northern Territory. We had them coming from two, three hundred kilometres away, and we had them all lined up down the side of the runway. And the planes would come in. We would then I would come on board, count the number of people, check the names off. Um, talk to people if they were able to talk. There were a lot who weren't. A lot of them were very badly burnt and a few of those did pass away. And I do remember um, when I went onto the plane, I think the first plane that came in, uh, there was a person who passed away in one of the, in one of the beds and that was quite um, an eerie thing because when you don't, it's literally you were seeing some pretty horrendous stuff anyway, but when somebody passes away like that, you think, oh, you know, so that makes you want to work harder and, and get it right and get all the people sorted out. Um, I do, uh, we did, we brought in, um, I think there were 64 people we moved in 24 hours. Uh, and a lot of people have actually asked, oh, why didn't you bring all the really sick ones in on one aircraft? Well, you can't do that because you have to have the people to look after them. So if there's four people on each critical team, and you try and stick 20 of them, that's another 80 people who you need on there. So you can only have so many critical and then so many of the lesser um, injuries, but we still had people on the ground in Bali as well looking after them at the airport till we got them back. So in 24 hours, we turned around the people who'd come in. They'd gone to Royal, into the um, Royal Darwin Hospital who did an amazing job, the best that they could, um, and then we organised for the flights to get them out. So we flew them to Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, of course, Sydney and Brisbane, depending on where they came from in Australia, but we will get them to close as home as possible. Um, and within, oh, I think it was within the five days when we'd sort of finished it, they, they actually asked me to get ready to fly to um, Bali, to Denpasar, and go and search all the hospitals to make sure we had got everybody. Um, and so I was all prepared for that, and then they decided um, that they would send the Red, the Red Cross were already there, so they, they would get them to do that. That was okay. Um, I was pretty worn out by then. Um, one of the amazing things was, this was the first time, well, I'd been in 20-something years at this stage, it was the first time that it really sort of was hit me afterwards about how I felt, and it was a really weird feeling. And I didn't realise it then, but this is the PTSD starting to, manifest itself because I had so many different um, trauma things occur over the years. But this was big and this was Australians and this was just next door and all the rest of it. Um, so what I what I did, I did talk about it a lot. I actually talked to my trainees back when I joined the medical training school. I would give them a lecture on, on this as well to say this is the sort of stuff we do do. Um, and one of the things I did do was I remembered one of the girls on the flight uh, on the who come into Darwin, she had been she pulled her friend out, and that she was the last one out of the building alive in one of the bars that had blown up, and the last she pulled out had had lost an arm and a big chunk of her her bum, um, and she was in pretty crook, and this other lass was had been quite um, burnt as well, and she had a, a funny surname. I won't mention it, but she had a funny surname. And I remembered it, and I followed. When I got back down into Melbourne, um, I knew she was from Melbourne, and I followed her up, and I rang her mum. I said, "Oh, look, just out of the blue, I've just rung her mum." I said, "Oh, would you mind if I came? Do you think she mind if I came and say so I could say good day?" Oh, and her mum was really um, 
oh, thank you so much, and so forth. And I was pretty oh, tough with that. And she said, oh, look, come on over. And I get there, and there's this banquet. <laughs> the neighbours are in, the families are in, and everything. So um, that was really good. And I'm still friends with them today. Um, I've, there's wow. about four or five of them that I'm still friends with, and I see yeah. them. Um, every now and again, they've had kids, they're married and all this, whereas they were on holidays before the, all this happened. They would finished, um, I think it was a uni, they'd finished at uni and they were then having this holiday and they were going to then do it, get back into work. Um, and they, they hadn't obviously, it, it had gone to custard, but now they, then they moved on. And okay. It's been really- yeah. There was a fair bit going on here, everyone. Now, Operation Sumatra Assist 2, the loss of a sea king called Sign Shark 02. Sumatra Assist, uh, I believe, Dave, was the code name for Australia's response to the Boxing Day tsunami 2004. And Assist 2 was the code name for Australia's response to an earthquake on the island of Nias. Would you care to talk us through the stories involved here? You know, the loss of nine military uh, personnel in a helicopter crash. This was uh, one of the most horrible days that, uh, or events that occurred um, because I was that close to it. I mean, Bali was bad, as as I've just explained, but this was uh, nine of my mates. Um, Basically, uh, I was posted to HMS Penguin, which is in Sydney. And the Australian response to the first, um, to the to the tsunami, had been to send one of our ships, HMS Canimbla, up there. And she'd just finished uh, doing work in Bandarache and she'd gone back to Singapore to um, uh, refuel, get more stores in, and then she was sailing back to, about to sail back to Australia when there was a large earthquake on uh, Nias, Nias, uh, Nias Island, um, a lot of the medical staff had returned to Australia, so they'd actually flown back and the ship was just going, was basically um, just going to come back with us after having been fueled. I was sent with a team of four people from, or there were four of us from Sydney, um, and there were others, there was an army unit as well went up, and we flew into Indonesia, we landed um, in Jakarta, put up overnight, um, which was a bit hairy because there were then bombings in um, Jakarta at that stage and the hotel was sandbagged, so it's sort of looking a bit Beirut-like. And we then caught a, uh, we went there by 707, and then we caught a C-130 to the area just off Bandarache because that was where the next stop was, and then we flew to Nia Song. And I remember landing in um, this little um, this uh, airfield, and when we opened the back door, there were armed guards everywhere and a whole bunch of soldiers. And initially, they thought we were actually invading. They actually asked us if we were invading, but we weren't, of course. We were there to help with the, the medical bits and pieces. And I um, went to the... Uh, we sorted all that out and we flew out to the ship and once we got out to the ship, we sorted ourselves out and the next day was our first mission and we had two helicopters flying. One was Shark 02 um, and in this particular one, there was a crew of, uh, there were 11 people on board, um, three flight crew and the rest were medical staff. I was in the operations room at the time because I was actually put in charge, second in command of this whole unit. And I was standing up there inside the communication center. It's all dark and they've got all the radar going and all that sort of stuff. And we heard a sudden urgent call from the other helicopter that there was a helicopter down. And I remember standing there stunned going, what, what is going on here? That is just horrendous. Anyway, it turned out that um, it had crashed in a little village called Amandrea up in the highlands. And... Of course, everybody starts to go a bit um, panic about who, what's happened, who's there, has anybody survived. The other helicopter immediately um, landed 
and two of the uh, 11 had been pulled from the wreckage by the locals. And those guys were immediately flown back to the ship, but there were no other survivors. So uh, uh, nine people perished. We looked after the other two guys when they came back to the ship, but it was knowing that we just lost half of our medical staff um, was pretty, uh, pretty horrible, as you can imagine. And, of course, we, this was day one of the, of the mission that we were now especially looking after these other people over here, and now we'd had this happen. But we continued, and that was the right thing to do in their memory as well as we, we had the job to do and we had to get on with it. So um, even though, well, not even though, they had perished, we went on and did a what I would say was a brilliant job in how we handled the rest of this town and we got some of the town water back to people and had run medical clinics and did all that sort of stuff. So it was pretty it was pretty horrible, as you can imagine. Um Dave, and finally, the storyline in US NS Mercy 2006. Can you very briefly tell us about this story? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um back in 2006, again I was back in Sydney and I got a phone call from the Admiral's office. And it's not often you get those <laughs> unless you're in trouble. And I um, made my way very quickly to the Admiral's uh, office, which was across town. And he um, said to me, he said, look, we're, we're going to, we're on a mission. We're going to send an Australian team to join the USNS Mercy, which is their, one of their large hospital ships. There are two of them, the Mercy and the Comfort. Mercy's in southeast on the West Coast and Comfort's on the East Coast of America. And basically... Um, I was to lead a group of nine, well, there were nine of us, um, reserve people and helping the locals. So we actually went back to Bundarache, um and we did uh, Nias Island as well with the Mercy. So I led in a small Australian contingent from uh, with lots of excitement <laughs> getting to the ship and then we joined this massive 70,000 tonne ex-oil tanker um, and join that in the uh, over there. We did all the bits and pieces, and and have made lifelong friends. Um, I still ha- talk to the American nurses that I serve. And when I was in um, Tucson just recently doing a book signing, um, she actually turned up, and I hadn't seen her in eighteen years, and it was just amazing that how how you do have these things. But we we had a couple of weeks on board, made a huge and. It's just the way Australians are. We, when we do things like this, we'll go all in and get the job done and we will notice for that. And uh, we all obviously, we did actually get um, meritorious unit commendations from um, that particular mission, which was which was very nice. But the reason we were there was to help. And, and then the actual um, missions have now expanded from nine people because we were sort of the first ones. So now they run to 50 and 60 people. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Dave, who would you like to see reading your books and where can people get your books from? Well, as um, who do I want to see read? Look, I reckon anyone up from 16 and up will, will understand what I've been trying to put. And I, I, the people that I've talked to, my friends who, as I said, were the ones that uh, pushed me into doing it, They've all come and said that it's really an easy read. Yes, it has some downs, some nasty stuff, and, and there's some laughs and all the rest of it, but it's easy to read, and it's just like me talking, apparently. It's just like that's how it's managed to be written. Um, I think anyone over 16 who's got anything vaguely wants to know anything about the military and how we do stuff, this is just a little bit of an aside. It's slightly different from perhaps what you might see in some of the other, other books the generals have written and so forth. Um, because I'm just a, an ordinary bloke who joined the Navy as a young medic and came up through the ranks and ended up being um, Lieutenant Commander. And as you as you have seen, I've done a lot of stuff over the years and I'm quite proud of that. And um, and I've been able to do um, to help Australia and other and other nations as well. I the, the, I've spent a lot of time in Indonesia over all this, over the years with different uh, missions and so forth. So, yeah. There you go, everyone. There's an insight into Lieutenant Commodore's David Lassen's life, 39 years in the Royal Australian Navy in the Medic Corps. 
Um, so I just want to say, Dave, thank you for giving me the wonderful opportunity to talk about, you know, yourself and your book, um, you know, the Royal Australian Navy. I found it captivating. I found it funny at times. I found it very serious at times. Anna says it's an easy read, but you do tell it from the heart. And for me, that was very, very important. It's absorbing. It's absolutely um, very tense at times, everybody. But it's very, very real. And it's well worth a read, everybody. David Lassam, LCDR. Thank you very much for coming on my show. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. I'm J.D. Crowley. Thanks for listening wherever you're in the world. Until next time, stay safe. 